Hi everybody, welcome to the evidence-based weight management in MMA session. We are glad that you've joined us today from all around the world and I would like to welcome Ben on stage. Okay, so hello everyone. This is me for you, the, those people out there who haven't seen me before. I've been working with IMF since 2014 as a researcher, also run on the backstage area for several years. It's a picture of me at uh, USC 200 there at the Fan Expo when we were there for Las Vegas for the World Championships in 2016. So it's just a basic overview of the topics that I'm going to cover today. I'm going to start off basically by just defining weight management, looking at some of the health impacts, such as disordered eating, eating disorders, you know, how weight loss in combat sports looks, and whether or not it is advantageous to lose more weight and do the heavier athletes win more often. So first of all, I'll start with what is weight management? So on a very simple level, weight management is essentially either weight gain, weight maintenance, or weight loss. And this is just a picture here you can see of the energy balance equation. And essentially, if we consume more calories than we burn off, then we're gonna put weight on and vice versa. So we're gonna look at some of the health impacts that may result from chronic or acute weight management within combat sports. So this is a paper that was put out in 2018 by the IOC. And they've basically highlighted REDS. And the syndrome of REDS it refers to impaired physiological function, including but not limited to metabolic rate, menstrual function, bone health, immunity, protein synthesis, cardiovascular health, caused by relative energy deficiency. Now, Carl's gonna cover this topic in a little bit more detail for us later on, and he's gonna talk us through some of these health impacts as a result of REDS. And this is also just a little look at some of the potential performance effects of relative energy deficiency in sport. And Chris is gonna cover a little bit more of this stuff in detail later on. So, so one thing that's worth mentioning is low energy availability. And it's basically a mismatch between an athlete's energy intake for diet and the energy expended in exercise, essentially leaving inadequate energy to support the functions required by the body to maintain optimal health and performance. Now on the right hand side of your screen there, you can see the basic energy availability formula. And again, Carl's gonna go through that in a little bit more detail later on for you guys. So I'm gonna sidetrack now towards disordered eating and eating disorders within combat sports. And essentially, eating disorders can be the cause of or be a symptom of REDS. So basically, disordered eating occurs on a continuum from dieting and restrictive eating, abnormal eating behavior, and finally resulting in clinical eating disorders. So this is a paper again put out by the IOC. And what they determined was that around 94% of elite athletes in weight sensitive sports report dieting and use of extreme weight control measures during their career. And they found around 30% of elite female athletes suffer from either an eating disorder or disordered eating habits. And that's at 18% for elite male athletes. They also found around 69% of elite females in weight sensitive sports suffered from menstrual irregularities. And obviously there's a higher risk of injury, uh, especially if bone density is low, if uh, people are in a low energy availability state. And one of the big issues that we see with regards to harmful behaviors is purging, either by vomiting, diuretic or laxative misuse. And these can pose additional problems with dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, which can potentially be fatal. And also, as you can see there, the immune system is particularly susceptible to the effects of energy deficiency. So that's, more likely to increase the risk of picking up illnesses. And obviously in the grappling sport, it's going to increase the risk of athletes getting skin infections or passing skin infections onto their training partners. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about some impacts of disordered eating habits once athletes have retired. And that's a picture of Ricky Hatton. He's a world championship boxer for those of you out there who don't know him. And he was notorious for putting on a lot of weight in between competitions, so much so that his nickname was actually Ricky Fathen. And this is a quote here from Ricky, and he says, at times after I retired, I was genuinely su suicidal. At 14 stone, nine pounds, my doctor told me I was a heart attack waiting to happen. I just didn't want the kids to see their fat, pathetic father 
or for them to be told how I've been a great boxer but throwing it all away. I'd eat a full English for breakfast, a McDonald's for lunch, steak for tea, and have six pints as a daily routine, often many more. And we see this in a lot of combat sports athletes, either in retirement, they were tend to eat a lot of foods and drink a lot more alcohol because they abstain from it during their career. But we also see it in athletes who are competing right now. And as Carl will touch on later on, the massive changes in energy intake after athletes have competed can result in a large amount of fat gain in, in a short period of time. Okay, so let's take a look at what the research says. And this is a paper from a Finnish group back in 2006. And they actually looked at the difference between athletes who weight cycled and athletes who did not and whether or not they were more likely to gain weight in middle age. And what we can see here is that after the age of 20, it was actually significant weight gain for athletes who were from weight making sports. You can see there the little stars above the graph, that means that the results are actually significant. And we can see in this next graph that the percentage of athletes who actually end up being obese after they retired increases with age and obviously the athletes who wear weight cyclers or, or weight making sports athletes were more likely to gain excess fat later on in life. This graph here just shows us pretty much the same thing here. We can see the line for weight cycling athletes there. Normal athletes and then just average Joe on the street. Okay, so now we'll transition just to talk briefly about weight loss and combat sports. Some of you may call it making weight, some of you may use the same weight cutting, but they're both interchangeable pretty much. And this isn't a new problem. So as far back as 1930, weight making in this particular case in wrestling was identified as being a health concern. And as we all know, probably there was an unfortunate death in 2013, Leandro Souza, and then unfortunately a few years later again, Zhang Yingbing. And more recently we've had Jordan Ko and also Jessica Lindsay who are both Muay Thai athletes die. And you can see there, Jessica was only 18 years of age and she was found collapsed. Uh, she died because she was trying to cut an excessive amount of water using a sweatsuit. So why do athletes cut so much weight? For people outside the sport, they probably have no idea why athletes would want to put themselves through these methods to, to cut weight and to, to get down to their weight classifications. And three basics is, number one is that the rules allow athletes to cut weight. The reason that most athletes do so is because they believe that they can gain a perceived size and strength advantage over their opponents. But a big part of it, it's, it's actually part of the culture of the sport. So we saw back in 1930, it was identified that weight cutting was a problem within wrestling. And then later on, we had the deaths of the three collegiate athletes. Um, but yet it's still part of the culture. And what we found is maybe some of these methods that were dangerous, that were used by college wrestlers who then had these methods banned by their sport. Those athletes, those coaches found themselves into MMA and unfortunately the culture came with them. So following the deaths of the MMA athletes, uh, the California State Athletic Commission, excuse me, along with the Association of Ringside Physicians came together to put out this statement, really trying to draw attention to the issues that we have within the sport of MMA. And the biggest things that they highlighted was these dangers, heat stroke, which can potentially be fatal, electrolyte imbalances also can be fatal, hormonal imbalances can affect people later on in life. And it really increases people's risks of having kidney damage if they're cutting an excess amount of water weight and also increases their risk of brain injury, which again is gonna affect them later on in life. So I suppose the question is, do athletes have to gain an advantage cutting more weight? It didn't work out for McGregor in his particular fight. So what we're going to move is move on now to look at some of the papers and see what the scientific literature tells us about advantage of gaining more weight. So this is a paper from 2016 from Danielle et al. And they actually looked at 71 title fights uh, with, in boxing to determine whether or not the heavier fighter was actually more successful. And what they found essentially is when the, the gained weight equals or exceeds three kilograms or 4% of the initial body weight, the rate of victories decrease and the rate of defeat at the increase, even though it wasn't necessarily significant there. But you can see there's probably two times as much chance of, of losing a bout if you are a heavier weight cutter 
within the sport of boxing. And again, you can see here the increase in loss rate when gaining more body weight. More body weight doesn't necessarily mean more success in the sport of boxing. Um, as you can see in this next graph here, that increasing trend of victory rates and particularly KOs and TKOs while increasing the weight discrepancy. It wasn't necessarily significant in this case, but an interesting one that we can see here is this dotted line. This is the, the rate of knockouts. So we can see that knockouts increase up to a certain point, and then the chance of you knocking an opponent out decreases if you cut over a certain amount of weight, which I thought was quite an interesting finding. Okay, so we looked at same day competition or one day competition, sorry. So now we're gonna look at what about multi-day tournaments. Okay, so the first paper, we're gonna look at boxing tournaments. And this is a paper by Reed Reel, who's an excellent researcher from Australia. And what they actually found was that they had 100 athletes compete, they were female, 70 were male. There's actually no difference in body mass regain between finalists and non-finalists. And as you can see there, actually only 41 out of the 85 winners was heavier. So there's only one, one bout winner extra there and three boxers were the same weight. Okay, judo, now we'll transition to Denzion Sport. And again, same research, a read reel from Australia. And we're gonna look now at whether or not body mass uh, increase is your chances of winning. And what we found here was, again, with the little asterisks as here, it was actually st st statistically significant differences they found between weight regain and winners and losers. And the same thing uh, being said for medalists and non-medalists. As we all know, grapple and sports require more body weight and it's more essential to victory potentially than striking sports. But what about MMA? They combine all the different disciplines. So do MMA athletes win more if they actually are heavier? And this is a paper from Brazil. And Chris will talk about this in a little bit more detail. But basically what we can see in this particular graph is that the winners were the athletes who actually regain the most weight. So they may not have lost the most weight, but they definitely rebound and, and regain the most weight post weigh-ins. The only downside of this paper was that the actual sample size was very small. There's actually only 15 athletes involved, eight winners and seven losers. So what about amateur MMA? Okay, so I'm just gonna go briefly through some data that I collected um, during the World Championships in 2018. And this is actually the first event where we had juniors as well present. So we had 23 different weight categories actually competing at this tournament. And what we actually found was analyzing all of the data was that the heavier athlete won 52% of the time, the lighter athlete won around 45% of the time, and you know just around 3% of the time, there's no weight difference between the two athletes competing. But when we look at that in a little bit more detail, we're looking at this pie chart here. This is just data representing the heaviest athletes from each weight category. So we can see there that only 17% of the time, the heaviest athlete in that division won gold. 30% of the time, the heaviest athlete within that category won silver. It was only 13% for bronze. And actually the heaviest athlete was more likely not to receive a medal in an IMF tournament. So what about the finals? Did the heavier fighter win gold more often on the day? Excuse me. We actually found that the lighter athletes actually won gold 65% of the time. The heavier athlete on the day won silver around 30%. So basically the heavier athlete was not the most successful in these cases. We saw that the lighter athlete won more than twice the amount of times. And interestingly, only four out of the 23 weight classes that we had, the champion was the, the heaviest athlete in their category. So that's about 17%. And of those four categories, you can see there, it was junior female flyweight, it was female featherweight, the junior male lightweight, and male featherweight champions were all the heaviest in their divisions. But interestingly, you'll see at the bottom there that the female featherweight champion actually weighed in heavier than the female lightweight champion on that day. Thank you everybody for being part of this session. So hopefully you uh, got some good stuff out of that and I didn't speak too quickly for our international audience. I think some of the uh, English speaking audience would struggle to understand the Scouse accent at times. So thank you everybody. And do you have any questions? 
All right, so let's um, bring Chris on stage. Chris, can you hear us? Yes, awesome. Yeah, hello. Yes, hello. 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 I'll get my screen ready. Okay, everyone. Uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And uh, just looking down the list of all the attendees, it's great to see so many people from around the world attending these sessions and getting involved with IMAF. All right, so uh, thank you there to Ben for introducing the topic around weight management in MMA and giving us some example data from uh, IMAF tournaments and other sports. In my section, we're going to talk about what are the potential effects that uh, weight cutting and weight reduction could have on performance in MMA? I'll just quickly introduce myself. Um, so my name is Chris Kirk. I'm a lecturer in sport and exercise physiology at Sheffield Hallam University. I'm also currently doing my PhD into the training practices and preparations of MMA fighters at Liverpool John Moores University. And I'm also an applied SNC and sports science consultant alongside my studies and alongside my teaching. All right, so, MMA, as I'm sure we all know, is a sport of very complex demands. We've got the technical demands of a high level of skill required in striking, wrestling, submission grappling, and then the transition between all of those areas. So we have to be able to prepare our athletes for, for all those skills in, pre in preparation for competition. Alongside that, we have a high level of physical impact from training day in, day out and weight bearing of uh, your training partners and your opponents. That translates into a physio uh, physiological demands of a high level of aerobic endurance, a high level of strength and power, a high level of muscular endurance, flexibility and mobility, as well as recovery. Now, all of these things are also required by every other sport that we could possibly think of. However, in MMA and in other combat sports, we have the added bonus, if you like, of performing a weight cut in the week to um, a couple of days before competition. Now, all of th this, sorry, all of these demands and requirements can be heavily affected by this weight cut. So what I'm gonna do through my part of the presentation is essentially take us on a quick stop tour of the scientific literature that's looked at the effects of dehydration and weight cutting on performance within combat sports. So before we do that, I just want to have a quick chat about what the physiological effects of dehydration are in the first place, just so we can get a good understanding and idea of the context of why performance might be affected by this practice. Now, the reason why I'm focusing on dehydration is because the, all the data shows that MMA fighters especially rely on dehydration in the final few days before competition to perform most of their weight reduction. Now, fluid is the medium through which our body's physiology functions. All processes within the body require the presence of fluid to enable the cells of the body to do their job. So when we remove a certain amount of fluid from the body, what we end up with is, first of all, a reduced blood volume. Now, this reduced blood volume leads to roughly 25 to 30 percent reduced blood flow from the heart on each beat. This in turn leads to an increased heart rate because the body has to make sure it's delivering the same amounts of blood to all of its different muscles and organs throughout, uh, throughout anything the athlete is doing. But unfortunately this increased heart rate isn't sufficient to keep up with the blood demand so we end up with a lower total blood flow per minute going to the working muscles and importantly to the brain. This leads to a decrease in peripheral blood flow and sweat rate, leading to an increased core temperature. Now, the very unfortunate deaths that we have experienced in combat sports from wrestling in previous decades and in MMA and Muay Thai over the last couple of years, those are largely related to these effects, an increased core temperature and a reduction of blood to the working muscles and brain. In terms of performance, a roughly a 2% reduction in body mass through dehydration leads to a 10% reduction in VO2 max, i.e. a 10% reduction in the body's ability to use oxygen. If we increase that uh, dehydration a little bit more, so 4.3% of body mass, 
we can have a 25% reduction in our body's ability to use oxygen. Now, alongside that, we have a potentially reduced neuromuscular function, which again, from a performance standpoint, if your central nervous system and your muscles aren't able to function properly, how well is the fighter going to be able to perform once they're in the cage? So let's have a look at how these uh, issues might affect performance in MMA specifically. A study that came out uh, a couple of years ago found that MMA fighters who reduced their body mass by about 10 to 12 percent prior to competition had reduced upper body strength and reduced lower body power. More importantly, they also had a reduced sit to stand heart rate response. Now, what this indicates is that their central nervous system, their sympathetic nervous system, wasn't able to respond adequately to changes in movement intensity or to changes in blood pressure. Now, this obviously affects not just the performance of the athlete, but also the health of the athlete as well. Their cognitive abilities were also impaired. This was related to the reduction in glycogen from low carbohydrates being consumed by the athlete, and the brain can only function through glycogen. Now, we're all aware that during the weight cut, the athlete is going to suffer from all of these things. But do they recover by the time they actually get into the cage? The answer is no, none of these aspects fully returned to baseline within three hours prior to competition. So straight away, we can see there's gonna be some negative effects on performance. So what about the actual force production that the athlete is capable of? At the minute, there's no data around specific force production in, a, in MMA, but there is an interesting study uh, from Zubak and his group uh, within boxers. Now this particular group, they reduced their body weight by only 3%, which is a very low amount, relatively speaking, in terms of uh, pre-competition weight cuts. However, their voluntary force output was reduced by 12%. And their force fatigue also occurred 16 seconds sooner than the group that didn't cut any weight. So they're producing less force and they're getting tired a lot quicker. What they also found was that the group that reduced their body weight through dehydration produced roughly half the amount of lactate as the group that didn't produce, uh, didn't uh, take part in dehydration. Now, this might sound like a good thing if the body's producing less lactic acid, sure, that's a good thing. But actually, this is due to the low, low glycogen availability. Lactate and lactic acid is produced when the body is consuming glycogen efficiently. So this shows that the body isn't able to consume glycogen because it doesn't have enough of it, which leads to reduced force and quicker fatigue. So straight to, so again, we're seeing some direct performance inhibitions or decrements from this process. So let's have a look at MMA. Now, Oliver Barley and his group in Australia took a group of MMA fighters and reduced body mass by 5% by dehydration and exercise in the heat. And again, if all of you who work with MMA athletes will recognize those terms, dehydration and training in the heat. That's what we do to reduce body mass. What they did with this group was they had them perform a series of sled pushes over 30 meters. So they had to push the sled as quick as they could, rest 10 seconds and push it again. Now they compared this to a group of uh, fighters who didn't reduce body mass by dehydration. Now the group that didn't reduce their body mass by dehydration are represented by the lines at the top. They were able to complete each sled push much, much quicker than the group who did engage in dehydration. The fighters who did reduce by dehydration, they are the bottom line. They were much, much slower and they didn't significantly improve after 24 hours. So their ability to perform repeated high intensity actions was reduced. Also importantly, the group that did reduce their body mass by dehydration, their effort was far greater on each sled push than the group that didn't. The effort to complete work is directly related to how long we're able to sustain the work performed. If we find the work is too much effort or too much exertion, we are getting closer and closer to fatigue and failure. So if we're talking about force production, it's not looking good. If we're talking about maintaining that force production over repeated efforts, such as what we would see in MMA, it's not looking good. 
And what about from a hormonal or biochemical standpoint? Well, Victor Coswig and his group, they took a group of MMA fighters who cut their body mass by 10%, much closer to how much they cut in real life. They took a series of blood samples immediately before and immediately after a professional competition and compared it to fighters who didn't cut weight. What they found was an increased amount of lactate dehydrogenase in the blood and an increased amount of alanine aminotransferase in the blood. Now, normally, we would put this down to muscle damage from impact within the fight itself. But the group that cut weight had significantly greater amounts of these enzymes in their blood before and after the fight. This indicates acute liver trauma in the group that cut weight. Now, we also have similar reductions in testosterone from uh, wrestlers who cut weight prior to competition, showing that the essentially the endocrine system isn't able to function properly due to potentially due to low glycogen availability, but also due to the strain of too little fluid within the system itself. So we can see from a force production standpoint, a force production endurance standpoint, and from an endocrine and hormonal standpoint, it doesn't seem to be doing anything good for the fighters and the athletes who are taking part in this practice to such extreme standards. Now, there has been an argument put forth, put forth previously that fighters might get used to this process over time. Their bodies might adapt and become better suited to it. So a group led by Sergio Men sorry, Sandro Mendes actually looked at this. They took a group of fighters who uh, regularly cut body mass and a group of fighters who don't regularly cut body mass and they reduced both their weights by 5% using dehydration methods. What they found was that there was no improvement. The group that regularly cut weight suffered the same decrements in performance as the group that doesn't cut weight. So this shows that fighters do not physiologically get adapted to the weight cutting process. Psychologically, psychologically, they might find it easier to go several weeks without sufficient calorie intake or without or a few days without water but that doesn't mean their performance isn't suffering now as we are entering an era where youth competitions are starting to become more organized through organizations such as imaf and it's going to become more popular over time we need we probably need to bring up the question of how damaging might weight cutting be over the course of someone's life from starting at a young age up until adulthood. There's a lot of evidence from wrestling that it certainly does more damage over time, particularly from the standpoint of eating disorders being developed from such a young age, which again could bring up the question of, is there a more appropriate way of designing weight classes for youth athletes outside of their actual body mass? That is a discussion that we're probably doing to have another time. Now, how common is weight cutting across MMA? Well, a group led by uh, Murray Gappen and his team at Harvard Medical School used California State Athletic Commission data over 1,400 bouts, ranging from people having their first professional bout up to world championship, uh, up to world championship fights. And they found that weight cutting is ubiquitous and weight cutting increases in severity from the start of someone's career up to the elite level. So, for debutants, people who make their professional debut, they were cutting around 8%. By the time they were getting up to world championship level, they were cutting 12 to 15%. So this shows that as fighters get psychologically more used to it, they're probably willing to take more risks in their weight cutting and try and push the boundaries a little bit further. But as we've seen, there have been multiple deaths from this practice, some linked to rhabdomyolosis, which is a kidney malfunction, due to a rapid breakdown of muscle tissue, due to low energy availability and dehydration. And I have to point you to Eric McGracken's website, which details all of these mishaps, if you like, and close calls from a medical standpoint within combat sports. So another next question we need to ask is, is it worth it? Does it actually provide more chance of winning or not? Well, there's been a few studies within uh, grappling sports where the amount of weight lost or weight regained does actually seem to be linked to success in uh, real life competition. But there's also studies, mainly from striking sports, that there's no effect of weight loss or weight gain on winning or losing. Now, it, we tend to think, well, in grappling, it's required. 
in striking, it might not make a big difference. But there are some studies in wrestling that show that actually the amount of weight regained when compared against the comparative skill level of the competitors doesn't actually make that big a difference. So let's have a look in detail at whether it does make a difference in MMA or not. Uh, ben highlighted the paper from Victor Coswig where 15 professional MMA fighters reduced their weight by about 14 kilograms. Okay, they're both winners and losers in these bouts cut the same amount of weight. Now, winners did regain about 3% more body mass than the losers. However, the bout winners also consumed more calories in total and consumed more carbohydrates both during the weight cutting period and the weight regain period. Now, this allowed them to perform more actions and reduce their output less during the bouts than the groups that did not consume an adequate amount of energy prior to the bout. So winning and losing in this instance is probably more related to the fighters who used an effective fueling strategy during the weight cut and after the weight after the weigh in rather than just they gained more weight. Now, this is supported by a study from Grant Breshner who had a bigger sample size this time with 59 amateur and 16 professional MMA fighters. They found in this study that the fighters who cut more weight actually lost more often than the fighters who cut less weight. And they found that the odds of winning decreased by 11% for every unit of body mass that the fighters cut. Now myself and uh, Dr. Carl Lang Nevins, who's gonna be speaking next, we used a small sample of the California State Athletic Commission data 62 professional fights in total, and compared the mass regained for winners and losers. We found that they regained 7 to 15% of their body mass after the weighing, but there was no difference in the mass regained between winners or losers, and no difference in mass whether the bout ended due to strikes, submission, or decision. We did expect there to be a difference within the submission group because it's the grappling stage, however, this didn't happen. Now, when we looked at the fighters' weights in the cage, we found that they're cutting so much weight that they're all stepping in the cage at least one division heavier than the one that they're officially competing in. And featherweights and below, and all the women's divisions, they were stepping in the cage weighing two divisions heavier than the one day that they actually weighed in at. Now, this calls into question, is this within the spirit of competition? And does it, and it's actually calling into question whether these weight classes are genuine weight classes or not. In my discussions with multiple amateur and IMF competitors, many of them are now starting to talk about competing one division higher as an amateur than they would as a professional. But is this a band-aid and will this approach continue into their professional careers? This is something we need to find out over the next few years. Finally, we also need to think about the effects of weight cutting on traumatic brain injury. MMA is a sport where one of the aims is to give your opponents a concussion. There's no way of us getting away from that. This is something that is part of the sport. But can we minimize these effects through more effective weight cutting? Uh, a series of excellent studies from Charles Burnick and his group doing the Professional Fighters Brain Health Study, they've found that neurological and cognitive deterioration over time is more linked to regular weight cutting and the extreme weight cutting when taking into account the number of bouts and the number of head impacts that the person has. This is related to the reduced fluid around the brain, allowing it to experience more trauma with each punch. So in conclusions for my section, weight cutting in MMA is extreme and highly reliant on dehydration in the days before competition. 5% body mass reduction has been, suggest has been suggested as a safe limit, but as we've seen from the data here, this still brings about very real performance decrements. And you could argue that talking about a 5% safe limit is irrelevant at the moment because MMA fighters double this 5% limit just as a matter of course, with fighters being three times over this limit not being uncommon. Now, it's unlikely that such extreme weight cutting provides any benefit for the athlete and most likely reduces performance and is linked to an increased risk of brain damage over time. So what are the next steps? Well, the next steps are going to be discussed by Carl in the next section and also for us to figure out how we can better manage this process with youth, amateur and professional fighters over time. Thank you for listening. These are my contact details on the page if you want to contact me after this session. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, 
Chris, can you just give me a, a shout to say you can hear me okay and see the screen? Yeah, all good. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to repeat the sentiments from, from Ben and Chris. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's fantastic to see so many people on the call. Uh, my name is Dr. Carl Langan Evans, and I uh, also work at Liverpool John Moores University as an academic member of staff. Um, I'm in quite a fortunate position in that I used to compete at quite a high Olympic level in Taekwondo, so have been a, a combat sports athlete for around 15 years of my life, where I used to make weight quite a lot, in certainly not in the best ways. And I actually completed my PhD in uh, making weight in combat sports, and I'm very lucky. I'm in a very lucky position now uh, to publish a lot of research in and around this area, and I also work with a number of professional MMA fighters and boxers, including some of those guys who are in the UFC, Bellator and, and Cage Warriors and promotions like that. So today I'm just going to try and, and wrap up and give you an overview off the back of the brilliant presentations that both Ben and Chris have given you guys and, and maybe consider, is there a better approach to weight management in MMA? To start off with this, though, what I, what I would really like to do is highlight a case study that myself and Ben were involved in a couple of years ago, probably highlighting... Um, you know, a, a case of getting it wrong. So weight management in MMA, getting it wrong. And um, I'm at liberty to be able to tell you who this uh, who this case study was on because he, he widely publicised that he was the person who was who was within the research paper. So this was based on an MMA fighter who's just signed to the UFC called Paddy the Body Pimblet, and those were his um, his starting characteristics. And this was at a time when he was making featherweight. Um, for the and held the world title within the Cage Warriors promotion. So myself and Ben and a couple of other researchers actually engaged in a uh, in an observational case study. So we didn't intervene in this. This was just an example where we looked at at what this guy was doing and to try and characterise the impact that it had on his body. And for him to make weight for a world title fight, uh, he was regularly losing around about thirty two pounds or fourteen and a half kilograms of body mass, depending on on um. Which, which unit you prefer best. And that was achieved across eight weeks in a training camp. And what astounded me, you know, not being involved for, in MMA for very long, was, you know, to, to coin a, a Liverpool phrase, sound fella, um, Paddy actually thought that this was going to be quite easy work. So it fascinated us and it was something that we wanted to, to look at and, and gain an overview, like I say, of the impact. In terms of what we did across the eight weeks, so, so each one of the eight weeks above there, up until the, the pre-water load, so prior to the water loading phases. We examined body composition, so basically looking at the makeup of, of the, uh, the athlete's fat mass and muscle mass and bone, um, bone mineral density and things like that, and skin fold thickness over, over the, at the beginning of this case study intervention. We also took a number of bloods to try and look at, a, at, at different profiles of hormones and see what was going on within the body. We also uh, assessed rest and metabolism, so trying to have, a, have an idea of, of what effect this might have had on his metabolism. And we also did a, a couple of different performance tests. And we performed that halfway through the camp, and, and as I mentioned, just before, prior to the water load. Post water load, we repeated uh, some body composition measurements and blood measurements again. And then we also did this prior to his cut. And then we were fortunate to get him in on the weigh-in day prior for him going into the weigh-in. And then we also repeated all the measures we looked at two weeks later to look at the, the potential impact of him recovering. In terms of the what happened to his body mass, so you can see there that he, he started up in the, the mid to high 80s. Uh, oh, sorry, he started off in the low 80s, and that was gradually reduced in and around um, the first seven weeks up until his water loading phase down to around about 75 kilos. Then after the water load, we have a reduction to 73 kilos and then a huge reduction in dehydration in only a period of 18 hours from 73 to 65 kilos, and then a massive rebound um, up to fight day, and then obviously two weeks later, as we can see highlighted here, and that's something to keep in mind because that's that's going to be a little bit of a focus of a part of the presentation discussion we'll have later on. This was his total energy intake. Again, probably not something um, 
unfamiliar with for a lot of people on the call, where you can see that they're, they're eating a, a fairly adequate amount of energy at the beginning of the camp and then this starts to slowly reduce and then leading into the cutting phase and the weighing phase, no energy intake whatsoever. And then obviously this individual also increased in water loading. Again, something I'm sure a lot of people on the call will be familiar with where they drink, drink large volumes of fluids with the idea of, of shifting the body's water balance to, to lose um, internal fluids later on when you go into the cutting phase and then typically he engaged in, in things like spitting, hot bath and sauna cycles to lose the rest of the weight. In terms of the impact on the individual's body composition, you can see there that he gets a, a marginal reduction in fat mass from say 12 kilos down to around about seven kilos and then a big rebound two weeks later. Uh, lean mass stays fairly consistent. So this is his muscle mass and you can see here that it stays consistent over most of the camp. A huge drop in muscle mass uh, in the cutting phase and this isn't actually as a result of muscle mass this is just more from a perspective of the the equipment that we use to, to measure muscle mass doesn't um isn't able to decipher between what is actual contractile proteins and what and what is fluids within the muscle bearing in mind 80 percent of muscle muscle structure is is water so that's what that is a result of but then that rebounds later on and then we can see his percentage goes down from 15 to 10 percent so still not at a very low end and then his skin folds also reduce and rebound as well from this some interesting data so the the top graph is is uh, rest and metabolism and the bottom graph is a vo2 max assessment so we're looking at obviously metabolic profile and performance you can see here that just just in the in the week that he's going into the cutting and the water loading phase we have a massive reduction in metabolism and some of you guys might have heard this coined as metabolic adaptation or as we coin it in the scientific world adaptive thermogenesis so you can see a huge reduction here which is not indicative of good health furthermore this is a vo2 max profile you can see in the beginning 50.5 halfway through through the camp it raises to 55 but actually when he's in in week seven just going into the cutting phase it reduced down to 4.9 so an actual reduction in performance going back to what uh, ben and chris highlighted earlier on something else i should should mention as well is is that this individual for this camp wasn't actively engaging in any strength and conditioning or any aerobic conditioning whatsoever and and again that's something that chris i'm, I'm very fortunate to supervise chris in his phd and that's something that chris is is looking into at the moment because we think it could be a of massive benefit to to individuals even even those who are cutting weight for fights real interesting data here is on the slide that i'm going to show you now in and around some of the profile markers so we can see here that this uh, these bars are are a measure of something called cortisol which is a stress hormone and you can see for most of the measurement time points that we've got there it, it remains fairly stable but where that's massively increased almost triple fold is, a, is at the weigh-in so when he's had that huge eight kilo reduction in weight to try and make um to try and make the featherweight limits we see a massive stress response in terms of a reduction in cortisol and then here we can see his testosterone profile and from our perspective this is actually the lowest testosterone that's ever been recorded ever in, in a male of this age. And um, so you can see that it remains for, you know, for, for the majority of the camp fairly stable, but when he starts to engage and go into the water loading and cutting phase, we get a massive reduction in that testosterone profile, which, which is not good for overall health. Furthermore, we also looked at something called urea and creatinine. So we can see those in the bars there. And again, at the weigh-in phase, what, what this gives, as an indication of is what's happening to this individual's kidneys and, and those uh, those numbers there in terms of urea and creatinine are actually indicative of, a, of an acute kidney injury as a result of the, the weight cut that this individual did and then finally we also measured the osmolality so a state of hydration and also sodium so an important electrolyte for water balance and again as you can see there highlighted in red during the weigh-in they were well and above levels that are deemed acceptable and safe and in this case actually when when we come to measure sodium if if this uh if, if paddy's plasma sodium was to actually go above 150 there's only one place that he was going and it wouldn't be a cage he it was actually being one of these so um if plasma sodium goes above 150 nanomolar then that can result in uh, in death so you can see that there was a real extreme impact from from what he'd engaged in here so hopefully going back with what Ben and Chris have highlighted, that, that should give you some impact or, or some, some insights into the impact of what actually happens when these guys engage in these things. But what, what can we do then or, or what are the considerations that we need to, to think 
talking about when we're making weight. Well, obviously, depending on the event that we're involved in, you know, whether it be amateur or professional MMA, as an example, we've got shorter and, and longer recovery periods. In some events, we've got random and planned reweighing allowances. And then obviously, we've got to consider about refueling for the event once we've made weight as well, because some events are as short as five minutes and some are as long as 36 minutes. So, a lot for, for us to think about in terms of how we put a strategy in place, and it's all context specific. In terms of strategy, I've been very fortunate over the past 10 years to be involved in some, some papers around this. So we wrote make, uh, make and Weight in Combat Sports over, over a decade ago now, and I've been very, very fortunate to, to be involved with some of these fantastic researchers in the recent ACSM expert consensus statements on weight loss and weight category sports. But for anybody who's interested, I would, I would um, encourage you to go and look at those papers and it can give you some, some nice overall guidelines. But to summarise what's in those papers, it's all about thinking about the chronic the acute phases of, of weight making so in terms of chronic we're thinking about the the months and the weeks leading into the event and then obviously acute we're thinking of the days and the hours leading into the event and there's different strategies that we can cover there but first and foremost it can't be understated that what we really need to do is uh, examine an individual's body composition because it's all well and good a fighter saying that they want to make a specific weight what we always do is examine their body composition to give us a, an, an indication of whether they can even feasibly and safely make the weight in the first place so i would encourage everybody on the call who have have athletes who are engaging in um, in making weight to, to get their body composition examined by by whatever means you're able to in, in your own individual context then we want to try and calculate if we can or figure out some measure of, of energy expenditure because the combination of having those two values, the body composition and the energy expand, can then dictate the type of diet that we put an individual on. And then we can start getting into some of the more, I suppose, you know, higher tech stuff in relation to periodization of intake and maybe periodizing things like carbohydrates around training. And this is all done before we really start thinking about any acute dehydration within the within the short term phase leading into the weigh in and then obviously a huge and a big one that a lot of people don't really consider in my view and 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 um, and plan effectively is the the refueling stage that's something else we need to think about as well acute strategy so like we say in in a nutshell in the chronic strategy it's very simple we want to increase expenditure and we want to decrease energy intake but acute strategy there are a number of things that we can do first and foremost we want to try and remove as much fluid from within the bowels and, and gut contents as we can and we also want to try and reduce muscle uh, sorry glycogen within the muscle if we can as well the reason why we do that is because for every gram of glycogen we have three mils of water bound to it so if we reduce the glycogen that allows us to reduce water Additionally, if we put an athlete on a low sodium, low residue diet, or if they're constipated, you know, we, we use medically prescribed natural laxatives if they have constipation. So this, this is prescribed by a doctor, not just going out free reign. We're then able to reduce the amount of fecal bulk that's within the gut. And again, that tends to be bound to water. So without engaging in any like really restricting fluids and heated environments and things like that, we can actually reduce quite a lot of fluid within, within the body. Um, you know, before before we start really thinking about getting into any of the more extreme gains. From there, we meant we might then start thinking about a planned reduction in fluids. And then finally, that that would then allow us to consider some perspiration methods. So again, whether that be active or heated environments, you know, whether it be saunas or bats. But this latter stage in terms of reductions of, of weighting, using sweating is something that we really don't want to engage in because if we get the other things right first, then then that means we can we can really focus on on losing you know weight when it comes to the heated environment environments in a, in a really minimal way and um, talking about what, what ben mentioned earlier on in terms of energy balance and energy availability i just wanted to cover this so energy balance might be something that we're all familiar with it's energy intake minus total energy expenditure so the energy intake from the food we eat minus our total energy expenditure so our rest and metabolism that our diet induced thermogenesis so the cost of eating food non-exercise activity thermogenesis so just general things that we do in, in daily living even like i'm doing today sitting and talking or or general activity and then obviously exercise energy expenditure minus those things from the energy intake we have a we have an energy balance number energy availability is a little bit different in the sense that what we do is is we measure the energy intake but we only minus the exercise energy expenditure amount and then the number we get we then divide by 
fat-free mass, so that's skeletal muscle mass and organ and tissue mass, and that gives us a number. And perfect energy balance, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, is zero, whereas energy availability is, is 45 kilocals per kilogram of fat-free mass per day. And this is a number that you might see uh, a lot within research, or you, you, you might see um, nutritionists or dietitians talking about as well. And the reason why that's important, going back to what Ben talked about earlier on, and I'm not going to cover this in too much depth, is relative energy deficiency in sports, because different numbers of, of energy availability, as we can see on the screen now, can result in, in mass gain or growth. It can result in mass maintenance, and it can result in healthy mass loss. But if we go below a number of 30 kilocals per kilogram of fat-free mass per day, that's resulted as, as low energy availability. And it's this number which is purported to lead to all those red factors. So the health-related ones that Ben mentioned earlier on, so like immunological function and metabolic effects and psychological effects and things like that. And then that, that green triangle is something um, coined as the female athlete triad. So it may, may affect male sexual function or menstrual function in females and then a number of different uh, performance consequences as well. So typically we want to try and try and um, avoid that number if we can. So finally, what I want to show you now, just to wrap things up in the last five minutes, though, is, is a recent case study that we did on a combat sports athlete. Because one thing I can say as a, as a, a specific nutritionist myself working in combat sports is that even when we make weight, we often have to go below energy availability. So we have to go below that 30 kilocal number. So within this study, what we did with one of our athletes that I was with, working in Liverpool, John Moores, um, we wanted to try and outline whether any health and performance impact during a period of low energy availability, so below 30 kilocals per kilogram of fat free mass on those symptoms of REDS that we highlighted earlier on. And for this individual, this was a, a Taekwondo athlete, not an MMA athlete per se, but one thing I can say is we've just repeated what I'm going to show you now now in an exact in uh, an exact same design but rather than an individual eight week camp we've done it for two years in a female ufc fighter and we'll be releasing that data soon and that's that's something that we're more than happy to share with all the imaf members when when that becomes available so this individual typically competed within the minus 68 kilo category so the featherweight category within taekwondo typically coming down from 72 and a half kilos but what we did in this instance is from doing a body composition assessment as i encouraged earlier on we established that we thought that they could actually safely get down to the minus 63 um, category, um, uh, the minus 63 category division in order to qualify for the European University Games. And typically this individual had engaged in what a lot of, um, you know, combat sports athletes do. So hardly any carbohydrates carbohydrates, a real big reduction in, in energy intake um, a really, really tough dehydration at the at the end of the camp and you know they, they confessed that they'd had a mental breakdown before in front of the father so when we mentioned that we thought that they could get them down to minus 63 they weren't exactly enthused at the thought of that but were happy to allow us to, to give it a go and see if we could do it safely and effectively so very similar design to the mma fighter that i showed you earlier on we did body composition assessment which is very very important in this instance to to look at the impact of what we were putting in place because we were intervening rather than observing this time we also looked at cardiovascular function we measured blood again we measured rest of metabolism again we also looked at a range of performance markers we measured skin folds across every week we repeated these other measures halfway through the camp and just be uh, the, the final week before the end of the camp and additionally, we also took measures of, of power on the top and also strength and also psychological function halfway through and then one week prior. And then leading into the event itself, so pre-cut, we took the following measures and then we also got measures on the way in and we also got measures one day after the event had concluded. And then similar to the MMA um, case study, we also did that for one week after the event, we repeated everything. And psychological function throughout to look at the psychological impact. In terms of energy intake, so what, what we recommend is that you, you at a very minimum, you try and meet the, the requirements or the minimum requirements of an athlete's met, rest and metabolic rate. So this is something else that we encourage uh, people to either um, predict or measure if they can. And in this instance, that equated to around about two grams per kilo of lean body mass of protein. So two grams of, of protein per kilo of body mass. 3.4 kilos of carb, uh, sorry, 3.4 grams per kilo of lean body mass of carbohydrate, and then around about 0.9 uh, 
uh, grams per kilo of lean body mass of fat. And that's that's the number that we tend to recommend because it's all relative based on the fighter. Some fighters are bigger, some fighters are smaller. But generally, we always recommend the, the magic um, three, two, one. So three grams per kilo of, of body mass of carbohydrates, two grams per kilo of bo body mass of protein, and one gram, uh, per, one gram per kilo of body mass of fat. And those macronutrients tend to equate to the athlete's uh, rest and metabolism, as you can see here. And it also provides enough fat, enough carbohydrates uh, to protect the immune function and also fuel the athlete and enough protein to, um, to, to protect lean muscle. Within this case study, we didn't allow any ergogenic aids, any supplements, purely just because we didn't want that to be a confounding factor on any of the measures that we were taking. We also measured energy expenditure. We did that in two ways, using heart rate and also um, something called an active heart monitor, which is an accelerator, uh, an accelerometer. And it's really fantastic because it gives us some really nice data like this to be able to look at defined periods of time and define uh, energy expenditure. You can also so do this with heart rate systems. So again, I'd encourage everybody to use those and, and they give some fantastic data in terms of internal and external training loads, as well as you can see there, calories expended during a session. So for this individual, they were doing three fasted, train, uh, three fasted running sessions per week, two hit sessions per week, two S&C sessions, and then the rest of the sessions were sports specific and sparring with one rest day. And from those calculations, then we were then able to quantify energy availability and again, we established during this period that they were in low energy availability the entire time. So in terms of what that looked like, this is the, the energy intake for the, for the individual um, across the weeks leading into the event. And you can see here, when we map that against uh, activity energy expenditure, we're able to, to come up with an energy availability number. These large bars are basically the week um, after the fight. So in, in that period, the, the athlete was allowed to eat whatever they wanted, how they wanted, and, and we just recorded that so if we consider this as phase one the chronic phase this is phase two the acute phase the days leading in and then this is phase three the recovery phase we can see here the energy availability numbers so this individual is in an average of 20 kilocals per kilogram of fat free mass in the chronic phase but went down below 10 in the acute phase and then was was nice and high as re as based on the recommendations earlier on in the, in the recovery phase so I'm just going to very quickly now in the next few minutes take you through the results. So we can see here the, the changes in body mass. So in the chronic phase, we're able to get, to get large reductions in body mass. And that means in, in opposition to the MMA fighter, we didn't have to do such an extreme dehydration in the acute phase, as you can see here. They only went from 66 kilos down to 62.7. But again, we do get that big rebound similar to the MMA fighter earlier on. This was the individual at the end of the cutting phase. So, you know, the the type of athlete that we probably want to see when it comes to, to competing. And again, we look at their body composition, similarly to the MMA fighter, we get that reduction in the, in the lean mass on the basis of water from the dehydration, but we don't get that pronounced uh, rebound in terms of the fat mass. So when we consider the impact of what we've put into place here on reds, if we look at a couple of factors just to wrap up. So firstly, metabolic. As we can see here, this is rest and metabolic rate. So similar to the MMA fighter before, and in the chronic phase where we keep things nice and steady, everything tends to be fine. But similar to the MMA fighter, when we really reduce the, the energy intake below rest and metabolic rate, we get that big reduction in, um, in, in rest and metabolism, as you can see highlighted in red. And when we map that against prediction, we were able to come up with a ratio and, and any ratio below 0.9 would be a cause for concern. And you can see at that point, this certainly was for this fighter. So, you know, not too much of a reduction in the chronic phase, but a massive reduction in the acute phase and then a rebound, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. In terms of blood profiles, so endocrine profiles, we see cortisol, very stable in comparison to the MMA fighter. There is a reduction in testosterone, but not nearly as pronounced until the acute phase in, the, uh, in, in this fighter. And then when we look at other uh, endocrine hormones related to reproductive function, they all remain fairly stable again until the acute phase when we get a, a big reduction in energy intake. Look at some cardiovascular measures now. So first of all, if we look at left ventricular structure and function, and we also look at right ventricular structure and function, which is a, an output of, of how the heart is working. No difference whatsoever at any phase. And then when we look at cardiac output and also heart rate, we see a nice gradual reduction as we would expect in a fighter who's getting fitter throughout camp. But what was a little bit surprising was similar to, similarly to what Chris was mentioning before, this athlete only had a 2.5% dehydration 
and we had a massive increase in heart rate and cardiac output, which is indicative of stress. So it just goes to highlight everybody that even small dehydrations can result in, in an effect on physiology. And when we look at psychological function, so these are some excerpts on the side from the, the fighter in terms of what they thought about the process. And then above on the top, we have something called a, a profile of mood states and then a total mood disturbance score. And what we're looking for is exactly as we can see there, an iceberg profile in terms of increased vigor in relation to the other factors of tension, depression, anger, fatigue and confusion. And overall, that remains fairly consistent other than the way in day when they're a little bit stressed across the entire camp. So no psychological effects. And finally, in terms of performance, we looked at things like strength and endurance and training response. There was no depression or irritability based on the measures from psychological function earlier on. They were able to complete all of the prescribed training loads. We also measured something called daily well-being, and that didn't go below a, an effective um, number, as you can see indicated in the red line there. And then finally, in terms of absolute and relative upper and lower body strength, we can see that from the, the bar graphs and the line graphs, this increases. In terms of on the top and bottom, upper and lower uh, force velocity profile and also power, very important for combat sports athletes, this increases. And then in comparison to the MMA fighter, their VO2 profile actually went up and remained up throughout the entire camp. Finally, just to conclude, and I apologize, I've gone over a little bit of time. As I mentioned, we, we let the fighter eat whatever they wanted to eat at the end of camp. And these are some of the examples of, of the of images, excuse me, of, of the type of things that they were eating afterwards. And I'm sure it is, is pretty synonymous with what, what you guys see your fighters eat once they finish making weight. And just talking about the impact, like Ben mentioned earlier on, about you know thinking about after the events and then also later on in life, this was the rest and insulin of the individual across the entire camp. So as expected, but in only 48 hours after the events of eating like that, the individual actually displayed insulin levels that were nearly 450% higher than a baseline and were actually indicative of type 2 diabetes. Additionally, their cholesterol... Um, in terms of HDL and LDL profile was at dangerous levels, both during the acute weight cut and, and, and the week following. And again, we assessed this psychologically and, and tried to get to the bottom of some of the reasons why we, why the athlete was doing this in terms of, and there's an excerpt there, hopefully that you'll be able to see. Um, a lot of it they were mentioning was because they, they just felt that they needed it and wanted it. And, and, and a lot of it was out of boredom, but they felt that the body was craving it. And just to, to, to wrap this up, the reason why we think this happens is, is because this is the energy balance of the athletes. Even though we've used gold standard nutrition here, they're in nearly a, a negative 105,000 calorie balance. And even after eating nearly 33,000 calories in the week following, they're all, only then in a, a negative balance of 95,000 calories. So we think this is psychologically regulated, but but also physiologically regulated. And again, going back to what Ben said earlier on, that can probably lead to a lot of health complications later on in life. So this individual actually won gold at their competition as well. So qualifying for the European University Games. So the, the final, I suppose, real brilliant, brilliant output on this data. And just to conclude from my presentation, we can successfully achieve uh, weight loss in these athletes through restricted and periodized energy intake according to the daily demands of training. The acute weight making strategies going very much back to what Ben and, and Chris highlighted earlier on should be planned, should be considered in context and, and you know, it's, it should be made with, with a view of what can be feasibly and safely achieved within a specific period of time. So, and that should be in, in, in my mind, in, in combination with a, with an expert, you know, whether that be a dietitian or nutritionist recovery is definitely key to performance. We've got to consider how we rehydrate athletes as a priority and, and then consider specific refueling. And then, you know, the rebound hyperphagic response, as we saw there, is a cause for concern. So this is something that we need to look look at in terms of metabolic metabolic regulation and the potential impact later on in life. So I do apologize for going uh, over time there, but I, I do hope that you found that interesting and I'd be happy to answer questions in line with, with both Chris and Ben. Uh, and I hope you found some of the information that we've provided today useful. Uh, and uh, yeah, a, a big thank you to IMAF for, for allowing us to come on and the invite to speak to you guys. Thank you very much. Good stuff, great stuff, Carl. Um, I, I think we do have time for a couple of questions, Sophie, or are we okay to ask these questions? Or Sure, you can answer a couple of questions. Excellent, brilliant. Um, okay, so I think uh, 
we've got a question that both Ben and Carl could answer here. I think we'll go with Ben first. Um, from Tom Nudson. Uh, glad to see the science support the fact that we all know to be true that wasting is dangerous and the upside is doubtful. But what do we do about it? So, overall grand scheme of things, Ben, what kind of things could be done to try and improve weight cutting in MMA? What do you think? Well, I say it's a difficult one to question to answer, really. But ideally, it's a case of obviously training, trying to change the culture within the sport through education. Uh, but maybe looking at real changes, you know, if coaches and athletes aren't willing to change their behaviours, if they still believe that they're going to gain an advantage by putting larger amounts of weight, the only way that we can stop them doing that is by taking the opportunity away from their hands and trying to implement some changes in the current rule set that we have. On to me now, Chris. Yeah, and you yeah, yeah, no, fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm... You know what? I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate, actually, to, to Ben. Um, I don't necessarily think personally that... And, and you know what? This is probably biased from my own experience. I don't know necessarily whether real changes would affect or, or affect culture so much. The only reason why I say this is um, from my sports side, I was involved in Taekwondo. We used to have morning of weigh-ins, which were two hours prior to the events. We still wait. Then they moved away the into the day prior um, in order to try and give more time to recover. We made even more weight. Now in Taekwondo, they have a, a, a random re-weigh-in re allowance with 5%. And what people do is still make weight and hold it. So I think we see, particularly in the MMA, MMA from professional MMA, whether it be 1FC, whether it be the UFC, whether it be the different commissions, Fighters, are cra fighters and coaches are crafty people. They'll, they'll always try and get around it whatever way we can. For me, stuff like this, it's education because as we can see from the chat, you know, a lot of people are saying this is fantastic, it's insightful, and I think it's really down to national governing bodies, to um, you know, world governing bodies, and particularly promotions to get guys like us and, and, and Clint, as, as people would have saw earlier on in the week, and, and, and people like that in front of, of big audiences and try and educate people on how they can safely make weight. Um, because we all want to get want to gain an advantage, but ultimately it's about how you gain that advantage and whether you do it safely and effectively. So I'm not anti-weight cut, as I'm sure all of us, on, on you know, all three of us are not. I think I'm just more safe and effective weight cut, really. But yet my experience personally is generally you know regulation just results in fighters trying to bend the rules rather than than meet them great stuff good stuff um and i'll just add one last little thing onto that Ed, is as far as the rules are concerned i think the only rule that will be a sensible change might be to increase the number of weight classes or reduce the gaps between the weight classes just to give fighters more options of well of either got to be the smallest guy in the division or I've got to cut my arm off to make the division because uh, at the minute that's the only option but uh, as with everything in MMA everything's pretty much led by one particular promotion at the top of the game isn't it on, on that front um, we have another question um, oh, where's it gone uh, oh, here's an interesting one uh, the UFC states that 80% of the athletes missing weight do go on to win their matches how do, we, how do the speakers feel about that? What do we feel is the reason why fighters who miss weight tend to win? Uh, do you want me to go first again? Yeah, no, I, I think you've, you, you've answered it perfectly anyway. <laughs> yes, I answered it in one of the, the chats I've earlier on to people. But yeah, I think a big part of it is guys are starting gales as well. I suppose they're starting cutting that last couple of pounds. So they're not really pushing themselves to the absolute limits. They're willing to just take the fine as opposed to trying to lose the extra weight. And in doing so, they're probably a little bit fresher on competition day, as opposed to being the fact that they've regained more, more body weight and you know they've got more body mass to uh, manipulate in the cage. Yeah, totally, totally agree with Ben on that one. I think um, you know having that additional stress, as as both Ben and Chris highlighted, you know, and, and what we highlighted in the, or sorry, what I highlighted in the uh, the MMA case study uh, with the professional. Just not having that couple of pound additional stress can can make all of the difference. Yeah, and the and the effects on performance are, as we can see from some of the data, are most likely accumulative. So, even though they might be cutting just half a pound more, that's on top of the ten twelve pounds they've already cut, and that's going to have uh, 
a much greater effect on performance than the previous weight loss. Um, there's a good question here that I think matches up with what gets discussed every single time we see a competitive uh, fighter miss weight. Uh, Lewis would think about the 1FC approach to weight control, and I'm assuming Lewis by this means the, the hydration tests that one do as part of their weighing procedures. Uh, what do you feel about that, Carl? Um, I, one thing I would say about the 1FC approach is you've, you've got to try and to, to put things in place to to affect change, you know, similar to what Ben, ben said before. Um, but I, again, I, I'm lucky I've been been invited a few times onto the um, Fight Dietitian podcast with, with uh, Jordan Sullivan to discuss this. It's still a system that can be easily manipulated and, and, and cheated. Um, the hydration tests that they use are not necessarily very accurate. And it is really, really easy to, um, to to get around those. And then, yeah, I, so I, I think from a from a perspective of what they're trying to achieve, bravo. I think it's fantastic. In terms of what they're putting in place, it's it's not going to affect change because, again, you know, the, the coaches and the athletes uh, are in this game because they're very smart individuals and, and they know the sport and they're able to get around it. And, and yeah, it, it is very, unfortunately, very easy to get around the rules created by 1FC and, and, and engaging weight cutting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's yeah, important. I think Carl covered... Sorry, go on, Ben. Sorry, I was going to say, I think the Carl covered most of the points there. Knowing a couple of people that they work with inside 1FC, I do know that there's a little bit of skullduggery going on with certain fighters. So even though they supposedly have been at a check weight or made the hydration, they might actually not have done and the fact that they're a popular fighter or a champion means that they get a little bit more of an allowance. I think the ability to roll that out worldwide is going to be near impossible. It's, I think it's a good idea in principle, the checks, but like like Carl said, you know what I mean, it's whether or not the actual hydration tests they're using are, you know, accurate and valid in any way. But yeah, it's, it's just too big a thing to try and roll out, especially for IMA. And I, and I think an important point to note about the reason behind the hydration test, one, uh, one FC are doing it from a safety standpoint. We, they want to make sure their fighters are healthy. But the hydration test they're using can only measure the hydration of the bladder. It's not measuring the hydration of the individual cells within the muscles, within the brain, and within the organs. And that's the important part. The amount of fluid in the bladder doesn't necessarily have any relation to how much fluid is actually in the body's cells itself. Yeah, so absolutely. We, we absolutely recommend their, their attempts because they're pretty much the only promotion and organisation doing anything about it. But it, it's it, it's a blunt tool for what we're trying to achieve, let's put it that way. Yeah. Chris, can I just pick on something from, from the questions? I think it's Syed who, who raised the question before and, and Ben um, has answered it. What, one of the things that we can't do, and I think Ben's answered this very well, is there are no general guidelines, guys, for if a fighter weighs this much, how much can they safely and effectively make weight? There's there's too many variables between individuals for us to, to, to be able to say, you know, at this, this weight, it's safe to lose this much. And in males, it's this. And in females, in it's this. And in something, somebody else, it's this. Because... As, as mentioned earlier on from, from Chris, different individuals have different levels of hydration status, different levels of muscle mass, different levels of fat mass, and it, it has to be bespoke to the individual. So that, that will never be a mindset or, or something that we, you know, anybody in the world could ever do, say, right, this is a system that every single fighter could follow to safely make weight because there's so many individual contexts. I don't know what your thoughts are on that as well, Chris. Yeah, the... Um... The interest in everything that we can to measure is so huge that it's just not possible to give a step-by-step, a, a, a -step, this is what you do at this time. It does require a deep knowledge about that person that you have in front of you based on the measurements that you take at a particular time. So it is something that needs to be done within the camp itself, potentially over several different fight camps in order to find out what the best option is yeah. for that particular person. And it goes back to, you know, if we were to ask coaches, well, is there a, a one approach, you know, is there a singular approach that every fighter can follow to, to get ready for a fight? They'd, they'd look at you and say, 
that's crazy. It's absolute lunacy. That no, no, there isn't. Every fighter is individual, and we have to train them in a different way. And and to be honest, guys, we can't stress enough. That's exactly um, the same approach for weight management. Every fighter is an individual, and every fighter needs an individual strategy in order to be able to to make weight safely and effectively. The question: a DNA affects weight cutting. As far as DNA. We have absolutely no idea. Any anyone who tells no. you that having a certain DNA profile affects anything about the performance or nutrition or health, they're talking nonsense. We do not have that level of information yet, um, particularly when it comes to something that is so variable, such as weight cutting. Um, I suppose we, I can play devil's advocate on that one, Chris, and just say that you know obviously DNA affects a person's physiology, and you know if you happen to be a larger individual more muscle mass you are able to cut more weight so maybe my answer yes there was you know wasn't the greatest answer or most concise well i think it makes sense in terms of you've got to look at the person's physiological makeup and their actual stature and muscle mass all that all that has to be taken into account um but i don't i don't know if an asking was from the standpoint of getting a dna test like uh, being advertised on tv and that kind of thing um we're a long, we're a long, long way from you guys. What, what you see, you know, so DNA tests for, for the right diet and DNA tests for what clothes you should be wearing that day and things. <laughs> yeah, we're unfortunately guys in sport genetics, we're a long, long way from, from that stuff. So yeah, I think, think the guys have characterized it quite well. We, we genuinely don't know yet. Um, a common one that seems to keep coming up, Chris, is if education is the key, then, then how, how do we do it? Uh, brilliant question. Um, I think it's entirely going to be a, could be, going to be a job for IMAF and the national organisations to essentially build it into their coaching frameworks, to build it into their coaching qualifications around making sure fighters themselves, but the coaches and the people supporting them understand the physiological processes and the outcomes of each of these processes. MMA is such a young sport that even now most of the coaches are coaching alongside their own fighting careers and it's been 30 years of educated guesswork and tri trial and error and that's produced some amazing fighters from a skill perspective but we don't really improve physiology through a trial and error guesswork and we certainly don't protect people's health through a trial and error guesswork so I think conferences such as this, uh, the work that Carl, Ben and myself are doing and, and a lot of other people around the globe are doing is going to be key. But then we have to transfer that to the coaches through education pathways, through organisations such as INAF. Well said. Sorry to, yeah. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but um, we only have time for one more question. It's fine. And then we have to end the session. But all the questions that aren't answered, we are able to save these questions and answer them later. That's great. Excellent. Um, okay, in that case then, I think, uh, I think we'll choose uh, Bob's question. How available are you as a whole to have the ability to counsel coaches and athletes with concerns about critical weight cuts? And a few other people have been asking about these presentations being available. Um, as far as the presentations, I think we'd all be very happy to speak to national uh, national organisations to repeat these presentations. So please contact us around that. Uh, and myself, Ben and Carl will also be uh, happy to speak to individuals about any advice we might be able to provide for your fighters that you are working with. Um, Carl and Ben, are you both happy for emails to be used that way? Absolutely. I think it's just um, one thing I'd like to conclude with really, Chris, is for everybody who's on the call, it's a massive testament to IMAF for, for, for putting these sessions on, these technical seminars. Um, this is actually the first uh, governing body I've been in front of and done a presentation with. Um, probably similar for, for you guys as well. I mean, I'm, I'm quite heavily involved in boxing. I'm, I'm involved in, um, in, in Taekwondo and some other Olympic disciplines. But, you know, not, not a lot of the guys at the top are, are actually... Um, proactive enough to, to get people to come on and, and speak to individuals about how it can be more safe and effective. So, no, credit to IMAF. It's been an absolute pleasure and thank you very much for inviting us on. Um, can I just say, Sophie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, are you going to be able to collect all the email addresses that people have left there for us? So, so that we, yes, uh, uh, I okay, have a whole you. list. That's no problem. Excellent. Brilliant. Nice one, Sophie. All right.
Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, any last words? I just want to reiterate Carl's point and thank uh, Mama for putting this on so that we can help to try and All educate right. people going forward. All right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Thank you very Take much. Care. Take Bye. care, everybody. Bye now.